to the Japanese Studies Program and the Department of Political Science, the School of Social Sciences, and the Japan International Cooperation Agency, or JICA, we would like to welcome you to the fourth JICA Chair Lecture titled, Japan's Experience on Peace Building, Bangsamoro's Journey to Peace. I am Marie Danielle Vigilien from the Atenea Japanese Studies Program and the University of the Philippines Asian Institute of Tourism, and I will be your moderator for this afternoon. JICA launched the JICA Development Studies uh, Program in 2018 in cooperation with various universities in Japan with the aim to develop future leaders of developing countries. This program offers an opportunity to study the respective academic fields of Japanese graduate schools and Japanese studies that explore Japan's modernization and development cooperation experiences in light of its historical and cultural background. In order to expand the opportunities for such Japanese studies in the partner countries, JICA has started the JICA Chair or the JICA Program for Japanese Studies um, in collaboration with leading universities in partner countries. Under the JICA Chair, short intensive lectures about various topics about Japan in the fields of politics, economics, and public ad administration and law, among others, are conducted by the lecturers dispatched from Japan. JICA can also provide reference materials for Japanese studies and research education opportunities to faculty members of universities who wish to establish or strengthen courses or program in Japanese studies. In the Philippines, JICA has partnered with Ateneo de Manila University Japanese Studies Program for the conduct of the JICA Chair Lecture. Our director, Mr. Rodolfo Narciso, and this year's acting director, Dr. Christine Michelle Santos, we're more happy to collaborate with JICA for, uh, for this lecture. The Japanese Studies Program of Ateneo, which was established in 1966, is the first and one of the most established Japanese studies programs in Southeast Asia. So far, three JICA lecture series have been conducted wherein participants from several universities and counterpart agencies were invited in order to introduce the JICA chair program and to share the lessons from Japan's modernization with more students and development workers. This year, JICA and the Japanese Studies Program also collaborated with the Department of Political Science under Dr. Carmela Abau. And our researchers who specialize in Mindanao, namely the team spearheaded by Dr. Jewel Kanudai from the Department of Sociology and Anthropology. In many ways, this event is a reflection of the interdisciplinarity seen in Ateneo de Manila University's uh, School of Social Sciences. Moreover, we're very thankful that uh, many uh, universities have come to join, uh, not just here on site, but also the one uh, online. In particular, we would like to acknowledge the presence of Mindanao Kokusai Daigaku, uh, Daigaku, headed by Prof. Ines Yamanouchi Malyari, who actually uh, include, uh, uh, gathered all her students to be in Mindanao, and I think they're online, and we want to show them here. Are we seeing them? So this is the challenge no, of having a hybrid virtual and on-site. So, yes, okay. Having said that, no, we will show them later. For the JICA Fourth Lecture Series, JICA and Ateneo have decided on the topic, Japan's experience on peace building, the Bangsamoro's journey to peace, that provides clues on how the past experiences of Japan can be applicable and utilized in the context of peace building in Bangsamoro. It is quite fitting that we are having this dis discussion a day before the International Day of Peace, September 21. Our program today has two components. The first part begins with a lecture from our esteemed guest, Prof Professor Hideaki Shinoda of Tokyo University of Foreign Studies on Japan's experience in nation building and how this was pivotal for their post-war and post-natural disaster construction. The second part is a panel discussion between representatives from JICA, BARM, the Office of the President, Peace Office, and Ateneo on their localized experiences and lessons on peace building. After the lecture the panel and panel discussion, we look forward to a fruitful discussion with you to better understand Japan and Bangsamoro's journey to peace and development. Before we begin our main program, we would like to give a couple of reminders for our online and on-site participants. For our online participants, please remember to turn off your microphone throughout the event. And if you're unable to access our Zoom chat, we are live streaming the event via Ateneo's YouTube channel. 
And to access the stream, please visit Facebook pages of Ateneo, JSP, and the JICA Philippines. If you have any questions for our speakers and panelists, please use the chat box on Zoom or on our Facebook page, Ateneo JSP, and these will, this questions will be read after the panel discussion. For our on-site participants, please do not forget to confirm your attendance at our registration table. We have attendance sheets which we hope you fill up to submit to our registration table at the end of this event. And similar to our online attendees, please hold your questions until I open the floor for questions after the panel discussion. With this in mind, we welcome you to the fourth JICA lecture. But before we would before we hear from Prof. Shinoda, we would like to call on Father Roberto Yap, the president of Ateneo de Manila University, for his opening remarks. Father. His Excellency Ambassador Koshikawa Kazuhiko. He's joining us online, Secretary Carlito Galvez of the Office of the Presidential Advisor on Peace, Reconciliation, and Unity. Professor Hideaki Shinoda from the Tokyo University of Foreign Studies. To our distinguished panelists, Senior Director Ryotaro Moritani from JICA Governance and Peace Building Department. Senior Advisor Naoyuki Ochiai from JICA Division 5 Southeast Asian Development. Minister Mohamed Yakub of the Ministry of Agriculture, Fisheries, and Agrarian Reform, Bangsamoro Autonomous Region in Muslim Mindanao. Director Farah Grace Naparan, Office of the Presidential Advisor in Peace, Reconciliation, and Unity. Dr. Jennifer Oretta from the Department of Political Science at Tendeman University. JICA Philippines Chief Representative Takema Sakamoto. Ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests, and welcome also to those who are joining us online. I see that you're already over 200 participants online. On behalf of the Ateneo de Manila University, I welcome you to the fourth JICA lecture series. Ateneo followed closely and supported the peace process, which led to the establishment of the Bangsamoro Autonomous Region in Muslim Mindanao. We are resolute in sharing the aspirations for peace and sustainable development in Muslim Mindanao. Among other initiatives, our School of Government has been working with the officials of BARM for capacity building. Our School of Education is working with teachers in the Bangsamoro for faculty development. There is still a long way ahead for Bangsamoro's journey to peace. Still, everything is possible as long as we are open to cooperation and collaboration and work with partners who share our commitment to peace, to the common good, and to the care of creation, our common home. On this note, I express our gratitude to the Japan International Cooperation Agency for conducting this lecture series. Thank you for sharing your country's knowledge, expertise, and experiences in politics, economics, public administration, and the law. Thank you to our speaker, Professor Hideaki Shinoda, the moderator and panelists. We also thank the Japanese Studies Program, the Department of Political Science, and the School of Sci Social Sciences for facilitating this event. This lecture gathers students, researchers, and representatives from government. We are grateful to our speaker, who will share with us today the best practices and lessons learned from Japan's history of its peace-building process. Japan's commitment to protecting human security is an essential lesson for all of us as we strive to facilitate honest dialogue and cooperation to foster reconciliation, recovery, and resilience in Bangsamoro and other areas where there is conflict. Let us build on today's lecture and challenge ourselves to continue collaborating to develop and promote a just, peaceful, inclusive, and sustainable society. Thank you very much, and we hope we will have a very fruitful afternoon. Thank you. Thank you very much, Father Yap. Now we would like to invite His Excellency Ambassador Kazuhiko Koshikawa to give a welcome message on behalf of the Japanese Embassy.
Father Roberto Yap, President of Ateneo Manila Universities and the members of Ac Academ, Honorable Mohamed Yaakov, Minister of Ministry of Agriculture, Fishery and Agrarian Reform, BAM, and distinguished panelists and speakers, Ms. Professor Shinoda Hideaki, Tokyo University of Foreign Studies, Mr. Sakamoto Takema, the Chief Representative, JICA Office, uh, Philippine Office. Uh, Dr. Ines Mariari Yamanouchi, the President of uh, Mindanao Kokusai Daingaku in, in Dabao. Distinguished guests and ladies and gentlemen, and dear student, good afternoon. Sorry, I have a little bit uh, <coughs> so a cold. I, ha I had a cold last week. And welcome to JICA Chair Lecture Series. It is a great honor for JICA to establish partnership with Ateneo de Manila University, one of the most prestigious universities in the Philippines, to host JICA chair course. I was executive senior vice president of JICA for four years prior to my assignment to the Philippines. The JICA chair program was launched during this time at the strong initiative of the uh, then uh, JICA president, Kitaoka, Dr. Kitaoka, who is also historian. And as moderator Marie uh, explained, this idea is based on the following fundamental uh, perceptions. Japan is the first country that has modernized from non-Western background to establish a free, democratic, prosperous, and peace-loving nation based on the rule of law without losing much of its traditions and identities. In that sense, Japan could serve as one of the best examples for developing country to follow in their own development. JICA launched JICA Development Study Program, JICA DSP, in 2018 in a cooperation with various universities in Japan with the aim to develop further leadership of developing countries. This program offers an opportunity to study the respective academic field at Japanese graduate schools and the Japanese studies that explore Japan's modernization and development cooperation experience in the light of historical and the cultural background. In order to expand the opportunity of such Japanese studies in partner countries as well, JICA now started the JICA Chair, Jap JICA Program for Japan Studies, Japanese studies in collaboration with leading universities in other partner countries. The theme of the fourth JICA chair is Japan's experience on peace building, Bansamoro's journey to peace. The Mindanao peace process is still an ongoing important domestic issues for the Philippines itself. And the Japan is in a position to support this process. In that sense, this is a very unique and interesting topics. Since 2002, Japan has been one of the staunchest supporters of peace and development and in Mindanao. We recognize its impact not just on the Philippines, but on the entire regions and beyond, in terms of socioeconomic prosperity and securities. In 2006, J. Bird, Japan Bansamoro Initiative for Reconstructions and Development was launched to assist in building momentum for the peace process in the Bansamoro regions. Its three pillars are capacity development for Bansamoro Transition Authority officials, support for the normalization process, and socioeconomic infrastructure development. Under the banner of J. Bird, Japan has contributed approximately 26 billion pesos of funding for more than 100 projects to date such as vocational training for livelihood improvement and the construction of national road in conflicted affected areas. There is another thing I would like to share in particular. Dr. or Madame Ogata Sadako, a former president of JICA, played a most important and decisive role in the Japanese government full support of Mindanao peace process through the JICA for more than 20 years. As you may know, Dr. or Madame Okata served a United Nations High Commissioner of Refugees from 20, 1990 to 2000. Then as Special Representative of Japanese Prime Minister for Assistance for Afghanistan from 2001. And as President of JICA from 2003 to 2012. Dr. Ogata's tireless pursuit of peace building 
and her extraordinary ability to take action stemmed from the concept of human security that she advocated. Dr. Ogata was awarded Ramon Mangsaisai Award in 1997. Ladies and gentlemen, the government of Japan made very clear its willingness to assist the Philippines achieving greater height, along with the request of the Philippine uh, government. As development partners, the Philippines and Japan shared common strategic goals. It is my sincere hope that Japan's support for peace in Mindanao will leave lasting benefit for all the Philippine people. Based on the assessment of parties involved, Mindanao peace process. The Philippine government, BTA, and other stakeholders must seriously discuss what needs to be done in order to successfully accomplish this politically very sensitive process. I arrived in the Philippines in November 2020, and the first town I visited outside Manila was Cotabato. I will also be visiting another town in Bam next month, this is to participate in the D UNDP project launch ceremonies financed by Japan to support Mindanao peace process. The Mindanao peace process is a historic challenge for the Philippines that must be accomplished for its further development. Allow me to reaffirm Japan's unwavering commitment to help building lasting peace and development throughout the regions as we continue our concerted effort I'm very happy to see the enthusiasm of the students from different colleges and universities who are joining us in our lecture today. Many of them are joining us on site and online, students from Ateneo de Manila Universities, Mindanao Koksai Daingaku, and other schools. It is my strong hope that JICA chair will be beneficial to all the participants. I would like to conclude my remarks by thanking Father Robert C. Yap and everybody involved in the hosting today's JICA Chairs. Thank you very much, and Maramin Saramapo. Thank you very much for your very warm message, Ambassador Koshikawa. Um, before we start, we would like to call on again our esteemed guests um, at, uh, uh, and panel members to be on stage as for we True to the very Filipino uh, culture, we would like to have a photo opportunity with all the guests. So we start with the photo opportunity. Um, first, with the guests and speakers and organizers, and then together with the crowd uh, and the participants.
thank you so much. Thank you, Chaika, for the photo op. Um, now it's now my on and now it's my honor to introduce Professor Hideaki Shinoda from the Institute of Global Studies at Tokyo University of Foreign Studies. Professor Shinoda's research focuses on peace building, international order, and national sovereignty. He earned his doctorate in international relations from the University of London in the United Kingdom. His extensive research and contributions to the academic community have been recognized through various prestigious awards such as the Yumiori Yoshino Sakuzo Award, the Santori Prize, and the Daibutsu Sujiru Ronden Prize. Friends, let's all welcome Professor Shinoda. Thank you very much for a great uh, introduction. And thank you very much for coming. And especially my great uh, thanks goes to uh, the great colleagues uh, of uh, Ateneo de Manila University, uh, ranging from Mr. President uh, Robert uh, Yap. Uh, and so, uh, and of course, uh, my uh, special thanks also goes to JICA colleagues as well as Ambassador. Um, this is a very much special opportunity for me uh, to speak in front of you. I've been engaged with uh, peace building affairs as my specialty, uh, my background of uh, international relations. Um, uh, uh, it's a shame that uh, I tend to focus on UN-oriented areas uh, in Africa mainly. So uh, while I met uh, so many friends, colleagues uh, from the Philippines, uh, especially from uh, Mindanao, Bansal Molo, in Japan, when we, I'm engaged with uh, training courses, opportunities, and so on, still I have a limited knowledge uh, of uh, uh, coming to the Philippines. So uh, I'm so much excited to be uh, engaged with you. Oh, I'm given 35 minutes, and so I hope that uh, I can uh, spend uh, around 35 minutes from now on. And uh, given uh, the enormous uh, amount of uh, the topic of uh, this lecture, I would like to highlight key theme, um, believing that experience of Japan from the perspective of peace building reconstruction might be very much interesting, beneficial uh, for many of you uh, who are interested in peace in Asia and uh, Bansar Moro, especially in particular. However, we'll, I never say that uh, anybody should follow the case of Japan. Japan knows the answer to any kind of problems. I never say that Japan's case is quite similar to the case of the Philippines or Mindanao and so on. Still, that's not strange at all. There are no two identical cases of reconstruction, post-conflict peace processes in the world, even comparing, to, uh, comparing two neighboring countries in the same region, Indonesia and the Philippines and uh, Sierra Leone, Liberia, great amount of different points. Still, however, all the more because of that, we really would like to learn a lot of things from other cases as much as possible in order to see some kind of similarities, some kind of points of lessons, some other kinds of differences and the causal factors of similarities and the differences, we can always learn quite a lot from any kind of cases. So uh, from this kind of uh, perspective, I would like to offer the case of Japan as one case scenario of uh, peace building, and not because I encourage you to learn this as a role model, but because I really would like to offer one of the possible examples from which you could learn quite a lot because of your capacity, creativity, and so on. Let me try. Um, oh, okay. Uh, my lecture, by the way, is entitled JICA Chair, meaning that the JICA is sponsoring <laughs> this lecture. And uh, offering JICA would like to offer uh, the opportunities for people like you to see the experiences of Japan. 
so that we can discuss these lessons uh, from your own perspective. There's a video clip uh, in the YouTube uh, which is similar to uh, uh, today's talk. talk, talk. Um, but, okay, uh, as you can see in my title for particularly today, having uh, somewhat consulted with the colleagues uh, in uh, Ateneo uh, University colleagues, uh, I would like to spend half of the time for Hiroshima as a local city case, as part of the peace building process in Japan. I hope uh, all of you know what Hiroshima means in the context of reconstruction, peace. I don't know how much uh, you know about the history of Hiroshima, but it would be very nice if we can bring the case of Hiroshima as a local city of a country called Japan so that we can see how national peace building process goes together with local peace building process. So uh, allow me to spend uh, half of the time given to me today talking about Hiroshima. But uh, let me first uh, begin with the case of Japan as a nation national case, and then I go to Hiroshima. What is Japan? Hiroshima uh, is the city, as you may know, uh, in which, on which the atomic bomb was dropped. And now it is known worldwide as Peace Memorial City. Many people come to Hiroshima to think about peace by visiting some places, museum, and so on. Our incumbent prime minister has an uh, electoral constituency uh, in the first district of Hiroshima. He talked about Hiroshima in New York at the time of the General Assembly, today or yesterday. And he uh, was very happy to host the so-called G7 summit meeting in May this year by inviting, hosting uh, leaders of other countries. And then uh, all together, they offered a bouquet of flowers uh, at the uh, site of uh, Memorial Park in Hiroshima. And uh, they did it, the same thing, with uh, mm, other leaders coming from Southeast Asia, South Asia, Africa, and so on. The president of uh, Ukraine, Zelensky, paid a visit to Hiroshima at the time of the G7 summit meeting to join us, join them in offering uh, his high respect to the victims of the uh, atomic bomb to discuss peace process in the current international society. It seems that uh, Japan is now proud of its record of uh, being a peaceful country, and Hiroshima has a symbolic status in this national identity. We don't have to be boastful, but uh, as a researcher, I would say uh, that uh, for the 78 years or so, Japan has never been engaged with any kind of armed conflict. That's, uh, statistically speaking, remarkable, compares to most of the nations. So the natural question from people who are interested in peace building would be like this. If Japan has become a peaceful country, how has it become such a country? Is there any kind of mysterious uh, manner of uh, handling a peace process? Or are they Japanese uh, so competent enough to make it uh, uh, so peaceful? I don't think so. If Japanese were so competent enough to make peace, perhaps uh, they could have done it much earlier. So after some failures, some trials, uh, as uh, 
result of the process of a lesson learned, they should have, might have become much better, slightly better than they used to be. And then they build up current state of affairs based on some of the results they built up before, uh, although uh, they were not uh, complete. There are lots of lots of human stories. I would say Japan has made a peaceful country, never surprisingly, as a result of efforts of many people who are really serious about the project of making it, the country, a peaceful country. Humans made a peaceful country. And this is a theme which I would like to emphasize in 35 minutes, in the remaining 25 or so minutes. Though what are the characteristics of those people? I don't think they are necessarily highly competent or uh, knowledgeable about anything, but they were very serious about the project of making it a very more, even more peaceful country and they knew having a vision was the most important thing. And uh, by studying the history of Japan and the history of Hiroshima, as a Japanese citizen, as a person who is interested in the history of Hiroshima, I'm honestly impressed by the people who made a great amount of efforts having, sharpening, developing their vision. What is the vision in this context? In order for us to talk about a vision, we need to know the goal we aim to achieve by sharing with other people in our same society, our colleagues, our dear friends. And if we get to know the goal, we need to visualize how to achieve it, how to get closer to our goal. A little bit more complicated manner, we would say that we set up, if we are interested in peace, we need to set up the goal of achieving a peace. Fair enough. Why? Because currently our society is at the level of absence of peace. What do we want to do? In order for us to give the vision to our colleagues, we need to visualize the process from the point of the problem to the point of solution and show the way in advance how we can get closer to our goal, how we can believe we might be, we should be able to achieve our goal. This kind of exercise of visualizing the process in relation to our common goal should be called a vision. Then how can we get that? How can we be equipped with it? We need to know the situation. We need to analyze, analyze the circumstance. And then we make a plan, very realistic plan doesn't sound very abstract, doesn't sound very unrealistic, must sound very visionary but realistic. And then we need to go to the process of trials and errors, implement it, monitor, evaluate, assess the result, and go back to the level of analysis again and again. In the end, one entire long vision should consist of a short, uh, should consist of uh, many cycles of short uh, processes of this kind of uh, exercises of analysis, planning, implementation, assessments. And in the end, our work is like this, always. I said that uh, I come across colleagues from Mindanao, the Philippines, quite often through MOFA training programs, JICA training programs, uh, for instance. I'm responsible for the program for human resource development 
in which I, we provide uh, training courses to young professionals on behalf of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. I've been running uh, for uh, the program for 16 years. Uh, under the title Implementing Body, Hiroshima Peace Builder Center. My main affiliation is uh, Tokyo University of Foreign Studies, but I still have a program identity called HPC, uh, based in Hiroshima to conduct the training courses in a symbolic city called Hiroshima for five weeks uh, by where the Japanese young officials as well as uh, those people from known Japanese countries, including the Philippines, we are now recruiting. Uh, one more uh, colleague from the Philippines uh, the, for the primary course, one of the core training courses we provide that start in late January. I'm talking about training courses because uh, when we uh, have young professionals, we discuss vision. We discuss the process to visualize our goal. How can we make better analysis so that we can get better plans to make sure we can implement our plan much better. We discuss it with the UN guys, JICA colleagues, and some civil society organizations in the countryside of Sierra Leone, Sudan, Afghanistan, and so on. And uh, today is about this vision, the process and the case of Japan is just, in a way, one sample. I therefore do, cannot go into details of history of Japan. In the end, I'm not a historian of Japan. But suffice it to say at this moment, they started with the problem, state of affairs of many problems. Japan has been, was, full of problems like uh, armed conflicts. Now we, are, we believe that and Japan has become a, some kind of uh, somewhat a peaceful country, but it was full of wars. When, even when they achieved a relative uh, peace, it was because of the uh, final result of the consecutive uh, wars among warlords. The victor of the final war uh, governed Japan with the power and so on. But at the time of the modernization, with the arrival of Western technologies and so on, they started a new process of modernization. I call it post-conflict peace building stage one, the first round of peace building process that started in the 19th century with the start of modernization. And the uh, second round is famously uh, the pro second round started in 1945, after World War II. It's very important to bear in mind, this is just a point in actual history. The peace building process from 1945 is the process of rectification of the process, first process of peace building in Japan, which started in 19th century. They had a plan for the first round, they achieved something, but they produced some failures. They reflected upon the failures, keeping the achievements, and they started the second round in 1945. What were the problems at the time? Let's say when the Japan studied modernization. I cannot afford to go into factual matter. I'm sorry that uh, sometimes it's very difficult to see the changes of uh, photos. But anyway, uh, at the time of the Revolutionary War, the start of the modernization, there were lots of lots of internal wars before the revolution. And even after the revolution for 10 years, Japan suffered from consecutive uh, series of uh, internal wars. It was very difficult to uh, stabilize the entire domestic society in face of many uh, threats from Western powers, trying to colonize many countries in the world, including Asia, including Japan. When Japanese politicians saw this reality, they had to organize some kind of a workshop as if they were having, they were having a training course. As I show, uh, in the photos of training course rules. 
they discussed it, they discussed problems by analyzing the nature of the problems, relationship of the problems. They agreed on the recognition that uh, Japan was in a national crisis. Why? Let's discuss. Threat of colonization coming from the other side of the Pacific. They sent uh, warships to demand that Japan should open the door to US and the Western powers. The threat of domestic disunity, it was very serious because of internal wars, miscommunication, and so on. They had to organize the workshop among politicians, policy makers, to discuss the nature of each threat. Why was Japan faced with this threat, these threats? Perhaps major politicians concluded because of the lack of sufficient military strength they were struggling with the threat of colonization. No ability to join in the balance of power diplomacy. They were miserable in the power struggles in international politics. Why Japan had a problem of domestic disunity? No nationwide value system. No strong central government. That's why. And of course, uh, problem analysis continues going into lower levels, more in details. But roughly speaking, they analyze the circumstance in this way. And then uh, usually in the workshop, we turn it around, transforming the problem tree into objective or solution tree. If we are worried about national crisis, our goal is very clear. We want to eliminate this risk of national crisis. Logically speaking, they should be able to do that by eliminating major threats. How could they eliminate major threats? Logically speaking, by eliminating causal factors of major threats, and then they should be able to eliminate major threats in order to achieve major goal. So let us have, let the Japanese politicians say that uh, let us have military strength, diplomatic power, as well as nationwide value system and a strong central government. They introduced many measures and uh, they achieved the goal. After some decades, Japan stopped observing internal wars, relative stability in domestic society. And uh, they saw Japan participate in great power politics, even having uh, armed confrontations with other great powers, but no more threat of colonization. As regards Objective tree made in the 19th century. Japan became very successful. But sometimes success produces problems behind the scenes. No armed conflict here tended to hide now, another kind of problem like discrepancy between regions. Especially northern part of Japan where uh, revolutionary people saw the regions where, uh, which had uh, anti-government tendencies, they remained underdeveloped. Poverty was prevalent in the northern par uh, part, and even if Japan almost like eliminated the problem of internal wars, they had to suffer from consecutive external wars. If that is the case, what is the point of eliminating internal wars? Many people ask the questions without knowing how to solve it. They continue the same practice in order by the time they hit the disaster. This is not uh, Hiroshima, but Tokyo 78 years ago. Once again, politicians, policy makers had to organize a workshop to analyze the nature of problems so that they can come up with the solutions. 
another kind of second problem tree for the second round of peace building process in Japan. Once again, different kind of national crisis. This time, it did not come from the threat of colonization from external powers, but it, was, it came from the failure of Japan's, its own, Japan's own imperial expansionism. And a failure of abuse of excessive state power. They believed that strong central government was a good thing, but that they realized that it might not be a very good thing always. Why did they have a problem of uh, failure of imperial expansionism? No sustainable external security policies, economic policies, and abuse took place as a result of lack of a sustainable constitutional order and no, uh, uh, no sustainable domestic economic system. They realized the need for reforms in these areas mainly and they came up with the objective tree. They introduced many reforms, prioritizing key areas that came up, emerged as a result of their analysis. Comprehensive, but uh, with uh, the very intellectual kinds of prioritization, systematic manner, and uh, for the sake of the common goal, like making Japan a peaceful country. Sometimes people misunderstand the intention of the uh, second round. What about the agriculture reform? Um, it was not bec uh, for the economic development, but because of peace. Very unhealthy structure of uh, agri no agriculture areas could be analyzed as a hotbed of expansionism because very poor countryside farmers love to go to Manchuria to exploit somebody else's land because they are very poor in domestic society. They were underprivileged. So they, as a result of reforms, they introduced economic policies for the sake of the common goal, making Japan, common vision, making Japan a peaceful country. It was not an easy process. I would say it took them at least three, four, five decades to be convinced of the validity of the path they pursued. And of course, there are some adjustments, even though main goal did not change. Some of the uh, lessons, failures, trials, Japanese forms of terrorism, hostage crisis, hijacking, all these took place in Japan in the first three or four decades after Second World War because of the debates and uh, disagreements about the course of post-conflict uh, course peace building. But uh, now people are very convinced three or four decades later. I made a rough sketch of the history of Japan. In relation to this, I would like to talk about the case of Hiroshima as a perspective of local uh, city in Japan. The story is simple. There are two peace building processes that I have already touched upon because Hiroshima is always a part of Hir Japan. Hiroshima experienced two rounds of peace building processes. One is for elimination of internal wars and the other for elimination of external wars, for instance. I would like to highlight the one person for the first round of peace building in Hiroshima, the first governor, Senda Sadaki. He recognized the problem existing in Hiroshima prefecture in line with the policies of national government. Threat of disunity, potential risks of uh, revolts by deprived ex-samurai, the ex-soldiers, privileged uh, warriors, and uh, very poor farmers. They attempted some revolts before, even before Senda came to Hiroshima. So they had a vision to eliminate, solve this problem. At that time, unfortunately, there was no advice from JICA or UNDP, World Bank. 
So the, his, he, his vision was sound in ideas, but a little bit simplistic. This is uh, contemporary Hiroshima, uh, Hiroshima Memorial Park. This part is called the Senda District, and the Virginia part, entire coastal area was a creation of Governor Senda. He obtained a huge amount of loans from friends in Tokyo to introduce gigantic reclamation project. Why? He believed he needed to give jobs to ex-samurai, soldier people, because they didn't have jobs after deprivation of their privileges. Farmers were very poor. Well, he analyzed that uh, because of lack of sufficient uh, size of uh, uh, ra lands, they cultivate. So let's extend agricultural areas. Sound simple, but may make sense, so let's try. As a result of huge amount of loans, he failed because the entire Ujina Senderland, newly cultivated areas were not uh, totally suitable, totally not suitable for agricultural activities. Senda was sapped, leaving huge amount of uh, debts on the uh, shoulders of people in Hiroshima. However, uh, the accidental event happened. He wanted to also promote the fishery industry by creating a modern port, which is now called the Hiroshima port, then called the Ujina port. It was not very popular at the beginning, but when the central government started preparing for Sino-Japanese war, they took notice of the existence of modern port in Hiroshima because the western edge of the railway system in Japan at the time was at the point of Hiroshima station. They constructed five kilometer railway between Hiroshima station and Hiroshima port in two weeks in the process of preparation for the war so that they can mobilize many soldiers, materials, goods, weapons to the continent. Because of a modern uh, port called the Ujina port, the Hisenda created, Hiroshima became de facto capital of Japan. Emperor, headquarters, military headquarters, national parliament, all of them came to Hiroshima to direct war command. And many infrastructure projects and so on. Senda was later awarded uh, after uh, sacking. Hiroshima established a military center of Japan, pre-World pre uh, pre War II history of Japan. Senda analyzed the problems and in his own way, his analysis was not sufficient enough. Uh, with, through accidental events, however, he solved his problems. Unfortunately, his solution hit the bomb. Total destruction, physically, psychologically. This is the second round. And uh, many people, uh, after the atomic bomb, ask the question, is it really feasible to think about reconstruction of this destroyed, entirely destroyed city? Many people left Hiroshima saying that it is totally absurd and even hiding the identity of Hiroshima citizenship and so on. Those people who were determined to stay in Hiroshima for the sake of dead ancestors, dead relatives, friends, whatever, very humane, emotional reasons, not the logi uh, logical uh, calculation. But there are always such people. They had to be very rational, at least in plans. It takes a while, definitely. So what is most important is to give people a clear sense of direction. Even though the project takes a long time, how can they, leaders, make people believe that they are going in the right path? They are making positive differences. That visionary stuff was most important. After the analysis of the problems and objectives uh, in Hiroshima, 1945. Mr. Shinzo Hamai, the first democratically elected mayor of Hiroshima, is the architect. Almost like a genius, I would say, in uh, checking 
entire responsibility for responsibility uh, reconstruction of Hiroshima. He was 42 years old at the time he became a mayor. He became mayor because all the senior guys were killed by the atomic bomb. He happened to be a government uh, city official who was most senior among the survivors. So people recommended him as a candidate for the mayor. He knew local city and how uh, he would think about the way he, can, he could contribute to reconstruction of Hiroshima. His predecessor went to occupation army commander, General MacArthur, that uh, please help us, but MacArthur rejected the idea. United States will never help Hiroshima because of bad conscience. Fair enough. Hamai approached MacArthur once again after he was elected, saying that he needed no money. He just needed spiritual support for his project of making Hiroshima a peace memorial city, which is his own words. MacArthur this time liked the idea, instructed his colleagues, the national parliament, to help Hiroshima. National legislation was introduced, but it was very painful because uh, no little few citizens that participated in the attempts like a ceremony, declaration, people stand and say, what the hell? What, what is this mayor uh, is talking about? Uh, there's no peace in this destroyed city. Just give us houses, foods, jobs, and so on, instead of something like peace. But uh, Hamai was determined to uh, pursue this way, believing that visionary work is the first thing he needed to do. As a result of this visionary stuff of making Hiroshima Peace Memorial City, he obtained some amount of budget uh, from the, the people who support this idea. And, and uh, there are many stories behind the scenes, but uh, they need, conducted many uh, issues like settlement of atomic bomb slums uh, by introducing uh, huge uh, infrastructure pro projects by prioritizing illegal occupants, not because of legal rights, but because of political reasons. Peace transformation of industries, weapon producing companies transformed themselves into uh, automobile countries in the case of Matsuda, uh, sports goods in producing companies because they had the skilled laborer on labor part of weapons and so on. They all held workshops to discuss how they could make use of their existing skills for the next generation. And uh, there are many stories like this. Uh, one final aspect is a spiritual aspect. Identity making is most important thing. Peace education and uh, survivor's testimony. All these strengthen the identity of Hiroshima as peace memorial city so that citizens can be proud of their citizenship of their city so that they can continue to work for the same project of making Hiroshima Peace Memorial City. So I'm sorry for skipping so many parts, but I wanted to say that uh, Japan has become a peaceful country. Hiroshima became a symbol of that country, not because of atomic bomb, but because of the people who wanted to make it happen with visions. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much, Professor Shinoda, for that lecture. I am sure that the lecture has inspired some questions from our audience to those online. Please do not hesitate to leave a question for Professor Shinoda on our chat box. We will read them later when we open the floor for comments and questions from the audience. Given Professor Shinoda's lecture, we would la now like to hear our panelists' thoughts on peacekeeping, particularly on the theme of Bangsa Memorial Transition Authority and JICA, JICA's efforts in post-conflict reconstruction and development. We actually have five speakers on our panel today, and I'd like first to introduce them to you, as I call them, and they will uh, take the stage. Our first speaker this afternoon is Senior Director Ryotaro Murutani from JICA. He is the head of JICA's Governance and Peace Building Department. He is in charge of the strategic planning and operations in situations of fragility, conflict, violence, including Mindanao. Please. 
Thank you. Our second speaker is Mr. Nayoki Ochiai, a, re a recipient of the 2016 Nakasone Yasuhiro Yas 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 Award. He is currently the JICA Headquarters Senior Advisor for Peace and Development in Mindanao. After Mr. Ochiai is the Minister Mohammad S. Yaakov from the Ministry of Agriculture, Fisheries, and Agrarian Reform of the Bank Samora Autonomous Region of Mindanao. He has, he has a track record of initiating and exec executing key, project, uh, key projects, fostering collaboration, and contributing to the growth and development of Bank Samora Region. Next, we have the Rector Farah Grace V. Naparan, who will who will speak after Minister Yaakov. She is the head of the Secretariat of the GPH, or Government of the Philippines Peace Implementing Panel for the Government of the Philippines Moro Islamic Liberation Front Peace Process. She has worked on various peace dialogues, the passage of the organic law, and the operalization of the normalization program. And not, but not the least, our last speaker will be Dr. Jennifer S. Oreta from the Department of Political Science of the Ateneo de Manila University. She was a U.S. ASEAN scholar under the Fulbright uh, program in 2021 and served as Assistant Secretary for Policy in the Office of the Presid Presidential Advisor on the Peace Process. She too has experience in peace talks with the MILF and has led a national strategy paper on the whole of government or whole of nation initiative. Collectively, our panel will continue from Prof. Shinoda's lecture by providing the context of the peace process in Mindanao the accomplishment of the Bank Samoro Transition Authority, the contributions of JICA, and the lessons that we have learned from the peace process. Through their insights, we hope to learn more about the Japanese experiences with the Bank Samoro peace process, the role of development within the space, and how BARM has moved forward with regards to post conflict, con reconstruction, and development. But first, let us listen to Senior Director Muratani, who will talk about the lessons learned from the Japanese experiences that have been useful for the peace process and the history of JICA's cooperation in the Bank Samora peace process. So thank you very much, Dr. Glenn, and thank you very much for uh, Ateneo de Manila University for hosting this event. And it's a great honor and pleasure uh, to be uh, present today. And my role as uh, head of the Office for Peace Building, uh, as, you, as usual, is to make JICA's engagement primarily focusing on the development cooperation to be as effective as possible for promoting peace in different uh, fragile and conflict-affected contexts. And that's why we are, we are uh, uh, presenting the, our organizational strategy, which is called JICA's Global Agenda for Peace Building, uh, which is the principles of our cooperation uh, toward peace building, and which, uh, are, uh, which uh, are based on the Japanese experiences of state building and peace building, as well as our experiences in uh, peace building in different uh, contexts. So that's why uh, today my role is to uh, digest uh, something what's presented by uh, Dr. Shinoda to be in how to, 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 to present how we can inter interpret or translate it into the uh, context of the Mindanao peace process. So uh, three messages I wish to deliver uh, from our, uh, as a principles of uh, JICA's engagement in peace building. First is that the peace building is a process as uh, presented by uh, Professor Shinoda. And this is a process uh, wi which requires vision and the process uh, that take uh, long term. So peace building is a long term process uh, with vision. Uh, Professor Shinoda uh, presented the vision uh, presented by the Japanese leaders in the Meiji restoration, as well as the, uh, city, uh, the leaders in Hiroshima city. But in the case of Mindanao, we have a lot of uh, leaders uh, who shared the vision, uh, which starts with uh, Madame Mogata, 
uh, who was the, then the president of JICA, uh, President Arroyo, as well as the, the uh, MILF LF leader, um, Rad Ibrahim. So those leaders and the succeeding presidents of JICA, of uh, the Philippines, and the leaders of uh, MILF and the BTA, and those uh, leaders shared the vision uh, for peace uh, in Mindanao. And a few points for the uh, long term, uh, the, 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 the vision. Uh, one uh, important thing is that uh, the vision is not only the leader's vision, but it's shared by many people. Because the peace uh, cannot be built by one person, but it has to be built by everyone's efforts. So that's why I think that the key uh, lessons we should learn is that the vision presented by the leaders was shared uh, by the many uh, involved in the peace building process. The second, mes uh, second uh, principle, uh, key message for the process is that it's a long-term process that we should uh, remain engaged. And in the long-term process of Mindanao, uh, the, the, the Mindanao peace building, we have many ups and downs. And we, with the leader's commitment, uh, JICA and the Japanese engagement has, to, has been uh, a long term. And we were all uh, encouraged to, be remain, to remain engaged so that uh, in, even in the difficult circumstances, we tried to support uh, the efforts of the people of Bansamoro, people of the Philippines, and the uh, leaders of these um, uh, organizations. So that's uh, key aspects that we should uh, we should have we should learn, and for, and, and lastly, uh, the the peace building is a long term process that requires a lot of engagement. So we have uh, many types of engagement of JICA in agriculture, uh, human resource development, infrastructure development, but it's uh, that the peace building effort spans all across different sectors. So that's the first principle we have, and, uh, and I put, we put the vision of human security as something that's going to be a core for our uh, peace building. So every time we try to engage in the peace process, we try to aim high, to aim achieving the human security uh, in these uh, different contexts. And the second uh, uh, principle we have is the, the importance of the institution building. But it's not only the institution itself, but the trust building uh, through uh, dialogue should be the foundation uh, for the institution building. So the, as, we, as you can see, we are trying to build uh, resilient state and societies that can deal with different types of conflict risks to avoid uh, future uh, conflicts. And for that, we try to establish a inclusive, functional, responsible and accountable uh, institutions that can deliver services. So I think the Professor Shinoda's lecture was touching upon different elements of institution building at the national level, as well as the uh, efforts in the Hiroshima city. And it's important that we should create the vertical trust, meaning the trust from the citizens to the government, but as well as the horizontal trust amongst the citizens so we value very much the social cohesion in the fragile uh, environment. But I think the efforts or in the Meiji restoration as well as the Hiroshima reconstruction, we tried to be inclusive so that uh, we, uh, 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 we tried to have a better uh, trust, uh, not only the vertical, but also the horizontal uh, trust among the uh, people. And I think what we are doing with the uh, leaders of the BTA is something that we tried to uh, en en enhance the trust of the citizens to the, to the BTA uh, government, as well as trying to enhance the social cohesion in the, uh, in the BAM region. And the third principle we have is what we, what we now call the HDP nexus, the collaboration of the humanitarian development and peace actors. And, uh, and this is basically, uh, the, the key message here is that the peace building is a, a kind of a whole of society endeavor. So it's not only, we, we shouldn't only think about uh, development, but we should work in partnership with uh, humanitarian actors as well as the uh, peace actors. And in the case of Mindanao, we are not only JICA, but in partnership with the Embassy of Japan 
and other international partners worked with the Philippine government as well as the uh, MILF to create the peace in, from different uh, angles. So I think uh, later we can discuss uh, about how JICA's efforts for reconstruction and development were worked in tandem with the peace uh, process, uh, peace negotiation, as well as the peacekeeping uh, missions by the international uh, monitoring team. So we had a, uh, we had a uh, vision that the development can promote peace. So that's something uh, we try to share as a, 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 a principle of the human security. But I think the how, uh, we, if we wish to develop, if we wish development to promote peace, we need to work with other uh, partners, including humanitarian and the peace actors. So these are the three uh, key principles uh, we have in our efforts in peace building. But I think uh, lastly, uh, I think I, I would like to echo uh, what Professor Shinoda mentioned in the beginning, that uh, this is uh, basically a principles, uh, and the, the principles we learned <coughs> from the Japanese experiences and, and, and JICA's experiences, but I think it, it's very, very important that we will be adapting these principles in the local context. So that's why we are not, uh, uh, we are not declaring uh, Japan can provide a model or a Japanese model is uh, a, a, a answer to the challenges here. But we wish to uh, learn from different types of experiences and we wish to find an appropriate uh, solutions uh, together with the partners in the Philippines, uh, in the Philippine government, as well as the uh, BTA. So I think uh, today we have a um, perfect panel uh, representing the uh, Japanese and Philippine uh, sides, as well as the Philippine government and the BTA. So uh, I, I should wrap up. <laughs> and so I think I am also uh, looking forward to uh, continue this conversation with other panelists. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Director Murutani. Now we would now like to ask Mr. Nouyuki Ochiai to provide information on JICA's recent cooperation on post-conflict reconstruction and development in the BARM region. Yes, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Konnichiwa. Um, today, I would like to, to talk about JICA's assistance on peace and development in Burma. Okay. Uh, in 18 and 20 September, in 2006, this is very uh, remarkable and milestone days for JICA, especially for JICA, because uh, on these days, 18th, uh, late Madame Ogata, uh, former JICA president, visited Camp Darapanan, which is the uh, administrative camp of MLF, and uh, she met with uh, uh, Chairman um, Murad Ibrahim, and uh, late Madame Ogata said, development will or can contribute to the peace process in Mindanao. Could we help you? And the Chairman Murad replied, yes, ma madam, please help us. Following two days, uh, 20 September 2006, uh, late Madam Mogata visited uh, Marcanian Palace to meet with the former president Makapagaru Aloyo, and she all also said development could contribute to the peace process in Mindanao, Pansamoro. Could we help you? And she replied, the uh, former president replied, yes, madam, please help us. Today is 20, sep 20 September uh, 2023, 20, so we have to celebrate the 70th anniversary of this day. 
For the, this is for the Bansamor peace process. Uh, as you may know, we are, um, we are now on 2023. Uh, the 20, in 2014, the comprehensive agreement on Bansamor was concluded. Before Bansamor, as, uh, Bansamor uh, comprehensive agreement, uh, Japanese government through JICA has been contributing for the, the uh, uh, facilitation for the peace process in, in peace negotiations. After the CAP comprehensive agreement on Bansamoro, Japanese government through JICA life effort has been contributing for the, the transition period in peace process. But this is very unique of uh, mechanism for peace negotiation in Mindanao for, uh, for Bansamoro. Uh, there are three dimensions. One is uh, peace for peacemaking international contact group, which was composed of United Kingdoms, Japan, Turkey, Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, and uh, some, some other international NGOs to, uh, to provide the advice to peace talks between Philippine government and uh, MLF. The, and uh, other dimension is for peace, peacekeeping, there is international monitoring team, which was composed of Malaysia, Brunei, Indonesia, Norway, EU, Libya, and Japan. They have uh, four components, especially social economic development is uh, handled or responsible for Japanese government through JICA. And for peace, peace building, for the rehabilitation and development, uh, JICA is mainly uh, ac active in this field of rehabilitation and development. I'll just uh, show you the, uh, I was a member of uh, international monitoring team in 2010. And also uh, Japanese government, the assisted the, uh, with so-called secret meeting between Philippine government and MILF, which it was in 2011. Uh, this was happening in Tokyo, at actually the Narita Airport. This is the first, first uh, memorial day for both uh, top leaders to meet each other. Uh, this is a Japanese uh, initiative, Japan j uh, stands for Japan Bansamori Initiative for Restructuring and Development. Learning from experience of Japan's modern nation building. Under j -Bird, we provide opportunities for Bansamoro on those uh, the learning from the Japanese experiences. We think Japanese experience on modernization and reconstruction could be referred to peace process in Mindanao, in Bansamoro as Professor Shinoda described. From Edo era to Meiji era in 19th century, as well as post-World War II, measures to peace and will to peace. This is uh, the point for, in terms of the, uh, providing Japanese experience to the Mindano. And also, the aims of Jap JICA's peace building are to create nation regions where conflict does not reoccur and to solve the discrepancy in the society and the countries. Before the comprehensive agreement on Bansamor concluded, uh, we are on a uh, pushing on uh, the in terms in the field of capacity development for Bansamoro, as well as enhancement of connectivi connectivity, uh, especially in the infrastructure, and also for livelihood and job creation. And normalization, before the decommissioning process has been started, we are trying to, to uh, provide uh, agricultural assistance for the combatants of MLF 
Uh, those combatants are based on the a label in, in livelihood. Therefore, uh, we provide technical assistance on agriculture uh, technology for the soldiers of MLF, even before the comprehensive agreement. After the establishment of Bansamor Transition Authority in February 2019, until now, one of the, our pillars for assistance for Bansamo peace process is on the governance, livelihood, and local industry promotion. Especially, we have uh, one of the biggest uh, projects, which is namely JICA Capacity Development Project for Bansamoro CDPB, uh, now ongoing. And infrastructure, we have been built uh, many road networks in Bansamoro area, and as well as farm to market laws in Bansamoro, and not only in Bansamoro, but also in Mindano areas. As for the normalization on, on decommissioning, Japanese government are now dispatching an ex-military personnel to independent this commissioning body. As, as for the JICA, we are now implementing one project which will contribute for vocational training for MILF commission combatants. Now, the challenge on transition period until 2025 One is uh, Japanese government through JICA has been contributing for, to in the issue of Bansamoro Transition Authority for the smooth establishment of BTA Bansamoro Transition Authority in 2025. Parliamentary systems, moral governance, and human development. As for normalization issues, decommissioning, policing, and camp transformation of uh, MLF communities. And also economic development, infrastructure, agriculture, energy, disaster prevention, job creation, decent works are very, very crucial and important uh, areas for challenge on transition period until 2025. And lastly, let me uh, tell you about the current activities of, by JICA for BTA parliament members. Uh, we JICA invited uh, uh, some members of uh, Committee of Agri Agriculture and Fisheries and Agrarian Reform of Bansamoro Parliament. They visited Hiroshima and the Tokyo. They learned about, uh, from Hiroshima, they learned about reconstruction of Japanese experience in Hiroshima, as well as they learn about uh, the promotion of agriculture and the fisheries, which were uh, experienced in Hiroshima. And after Hiroshima visiting, uh, they visited Tokyo, and they visited the uh, diet, and they met with some uh, parliament members of Japanese uh, parliament, and they discussed about how a parliamentary cabinet system has been um, uh, created in Japan and also has been uh, implemented or mo uh, modernized in Japan. So they learned a lot from the two weeks uh, study tour in Hiroshima and Tokyo. Uh, after me, uh, Dr. Minister Yakov will, I, I think will, he will discuss about the experience in Hiroshima and Tokyo. Well, that's all. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Rochiai, for your thoughts on the reconstruction and development in Warm. And since you initially mentioned about, um, we'd like to invite Mr. Uh, Minister Mohammad Yaqob to give insights into the achievements done in the Bangsamoro region and the lessons you've learned from your recent trip to Japan. Thank you.
Thank you very much. My courtesy to the Ateneo de Manila president, the Chaika uh, head in Manila, the participant. Uh, I'm going to be presenting the uh, Bangsamoro Transition Authority BTA status, focus on governance and challenges, and I will include uh, agriculture, fisheries, industries, achievement and challenges. So now, let me begin to uh, discuss briefly the Mindanao background. Mindanao is the second largest and southernmost major islands of the Philippines. It is known for its uh, cultural diversity, as you see, natural resources, and stunning landscapes. The population of Mindanao was around 25 million people, and majority of its population were Moro people. It is considered the basket uh, country's food basket. Why there is a conflict? The historical context reveals the root of uh, uh, modern struggle stemming from the creation of the Department of Mindanao and Sulu in 1914 without any plebiscite, which marginalized some Muslim communities, sparked the Moro rebellion to fight what is supposed to be there, and there is the result, the multiple peace agreement between the Moro and the government of the Philippines. So let us uh, uh, go to the, what the progress of peace process now. Uh, as I said, there is a multiple agreement between the government and the Bangsamoro people to sit there, the problem. The first agreement was the Tripoli Agreement in 1976 uh, during our uh, president, uh, Ferdinand Marcos. So he started the peace process and now he signed to end the peace process. Uh, because of uh, challenging in the implementation of that agreement. Uh, 20 years after, uh, there is another agreement between the government, we called Jakarta Accord in 1996. Uh, so the stand of the MILF during that negotiation, wait and see. So after the agreement, again, uh, there is a challenge in the implementation in which the IMLF continuing seeking uh, again the negotiation and that lead to the uh, after 19 uh, years negotiation so they conclude on having the comprehensive agreement between the MILF and the uh, government so we are lucky having the very uh, strong and put, have a political will, President, President Duterte, and uh, he pushed the peace process until the, uh, the, the creation, the, he created the uh, Bangsamoro Transition Commission, drafted the law based on the uh, comprehensive agreement, and uh, uh, way back 2019, uh, the uh, law approved and signed by him and right after the plebiscite conducted and that the establishment of the Bangsamoro Transition Authority. So from 2019 up to date, what is accomplishment? So this is the focus of my presentation. So uh, 
the roadmap from the comprehensive agreement, then the, the, the enactment of uh, the law, uh, we have now BOL. And in BOL, uh, that the establishment of uh, the uh, Bangsamuro Transition Authority uh, after ratification of uh, uh, Bangsamuro people. And uh, the president automatically appoint 80 member of the parliament, including the chief minister, and those who uh, tasked to run the operation of the very infant uh, uh, Bangsamuro uh, Autonomous Region in Muslim Mindanao. So we have to track the uh, transition authority, the, the Bangsamuro Transition Authority as government, and we have the normalization in which uh, part of it, the uh, recruitment of the MLF, MNLF to join with the national police. So that now ongoing process. Uh, we have the uh, BTA almost uh, four years na, ngayon. And uh, recently the police recruitment started and there is ongoing normalization process. Uh, what we achieve in, in uh, this four years past. So, next. The achievement uh, I want to present here, uh, two things, governance and agriculture, fisheries, and industries. On governance, we uh, have uh, four uh, very important uh, law enacted by the Parliament of the Bangsamuro. So one, the civil uh, service code, uh, second, electoral code, and educational code, of course, administrative code. And there is eight agencies, offices, in addition to 15 ministries mentioned in the BOL, and of course, the parliament able to uh, approve the uh, uh, Bangsamoro identity. We have a flag, we have uh, him, we have the seal, uh, as we presented uh, here. So on agriculture, uh, next slide, uh, we already established the sustainable agri-fisheries services based on the food security. Actually, the UN FAO and World Food assisted that to, to establish that, uh, to create that uh, food security roadmap in which uh, that is our, our uh, 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 guide in, in the implementation of uh, agriculture, fisheries, and agrarian reform services. Uh, we strengthen the research and development because we understand for us to have a quality uh, products and uh, 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 fisheries uh, industry, we have to make on the basis of uh, research to have a scientific, scientific base uh, program of our ministry. And of course, we strengthen the uh, implementation of agrarian reform in that area uh, in which our president very supportive to improve the implementation of agrarian reform in the country. Next, uh, although we have an achievement somehow, but we have the challenges. On the governance, we still have challenge on capacity building. And uh, thank you very much for JICA for their focusing on capacitating the people of uh, Bangsamoro. Uh, second security uh, concern, as government uh, established through negotiation, we cannot expect overnight to finish all those uh, challenges on security. So we do hope, end of the day, when the government, Bangsamoro government uh, 
uh, established and institutionalized later on the conflict uh, in areas will be uh, coming down and in fact uh, uh, last week no less than the governor of uh, Sulu uh, announced officially during the Bangsamoro uh, Economic Council that Sulu uh, no longer uh, Abu Sayyaf activities in their province. Means there is Abu Sayyaf, but uh, there is no longer active uh, in that area. Maybe they are going to satisfy with the services of the government. And uh, of course, resource management. We are uh, acknowledging the new government starting from the uh, uh, institutionalization of different ministries and we have challenges on, on the resource uh, management. Next. So uh, on the agriculture, we have challenges on sustainable implementation, connectivity, you know, uh, BARM is uh, most of uh, its province is our island uh, provinces. We have difficulty on connectivity. Uh, of course, in, uh, infrastructure development, market access, and uh, uh, the climate change adaptation. So those are our challenges. There is another challenges, but this is the uh, most challenges we are facing now. Uh, what, uh, next, next uh, slide. How BTA, BARM, and uh, Chaika uh, are working together to solve those challenges. So we have here uh, areas that, uh, as mentioned by uh, Uche San, uh, the BARM collaborate with Chaika on these areas, uh, infrastructure development. We need uh, uh, more infrastructure, especially on uh, uh, farm to market food uh, because of that the effect of long conflict many areas rural areas don't have uh, even uh, uh, rap root so uh, that uh, really the uh, collaboration of uh, JICA in fact JICA is heading the uh, BIDAC the uh, Bangsamoro development uh, uh, donor community in the uh, infrastructure. Uh, agriculture and uh, uh, rural development. Uh, Chaika, part, uh, one of our very uh, important partner on agriculture fisheries. Uh, governance and uh, institutional uh, strengthening and uh, uh, environmental sustainability and skills training and uh, employment those areas with BDA BTA and uh, Chaika collaboration so uh, to continue uh, Chaika supporting the BARM they facilitated recently our trip as educational tour in Japan uh, the Committee on Agriculture Fisheries and Agrarian Reform went there to see actual uh, how Japan ministerial cabinet uh, system implemented. And uh, of course the uh, technological development, uh, how Japan implement on agriculture, fisheries, industries, uh, for us to see how can we uh, take a lesson learned and enhance our capacity in making a law for uh, pushing the implementation of agriculture fisheries industries. Uh, of course, uh, we want to learn the technology that uh, implement there. So this is some of our pictures. Uh, we, uh, we came to Hiroshima. We made our courtesy to the governor of Hiroshima Prefecture. We visited also the office of city mayor and uh, the office of vice uh, chair of the Hiroshima Prefecture Assembly. 
So they are, oh, they were all, oh, they were uh, advise us uh, and inform us many interesting history of the Hiroshima Prefecture at one of part of our lessons learned. We visited, uh, uh, of course, Peace Memorial Park. Very interesting. You see, I am uh, the one who uh, uh, put the flower to the uh, the peace. Uh, uh, yeah, so very interesting moment for me. The first time happened in my life uh, to manifest support of the peace, world peace. Uh, next, we visited the uh, agriculture. Uh, uh, science High School. Uh, we uh, surprised that Chaika even before World War, they, they, they have already the high school. This is very, very old agriculture high school. That's manifestation of Chaika. Uh, Japan really promote agriculture. And we visited the uh, fisheries research center. Imagine one, uh, one uh, uh, fisheries uh, a research center there in Hiroshima have more than 200 peace cages as experiment. Very huge uh, uh, facilities that promote uh, fish industry in the Hiroshima. But despite of uh, uh, that promotion, we're surprised the number of officers, peace box in uh, Hiroshima, Hindi, Hindi po umawud, cannot not reach 200. Uh, in, in, in the Bangsamoor region, we have more than uh, uh, 20,000 uh, fishermen. But the definition of fishermen is different uh, because the fishermen there have many uh, ship to catch fish. In ours, even isang bangka wala sila. So that's the difference. And we do hope uh, by uh, this government the support the national government and with collaboration of Bank Samoro will have the, uh, those uh, things. Uh, next, this is product of uh, agriculture cooperative uh, from product, uh, uh, planting, uh, processing, and marketing. The whole value chains, uh, the cooperative uh, uh, doing. Next, uh, after uh, seven days and on, on uh, September 10 we came to Tokyo and we meet the foreign affair and uh, of course the Philippine, Germ uh, Japan, Philippine uh, ministerial uh, cabinet uh, league uh, we uh, meet the president of that league and uh, with, a comp uh, with the president of uh, our uh, Here, Excellency, uh, our ambassador in Tokyo. And the other day, we visited our embassy as courtesy. We uh, have very, uh, very interesting dialogue with our ambassador. In fact, uh, he offered us lunch that after uh, our, our courtesy to, to hear. So finally, uh, uh, we have the series of uh, lecture on the function of diet uh, and uh, uh, what is the relation of uh, national government with the local government. So we found out that uh, uh, the Bangsamuru region a uh, little bit similar with uh, the, the structure of uh, Japan government. So the, the prime minister elected by the diet members but the governors of uh, uh, perpetuals elected directly by people. So uh, that's uh, uh, our structure in the Bangsamoor region. The chief minister elected, suppo supposed to be, but this time appointed by the president. But I think uh, once we have the election by 2025, the chief minister will be will be appointed by the elected uh, parliament members, and uh, our governors, of course, uh, under the presidential uh, form of government, and they will directly uh, vote by the people of the province. So that the similarity, and I think uh, 
uh, some of our uh, delegation realize uh, we can uh, learn and examine more the uh, relation of the uh, national government in Japan with the local government to learn more, to apply uh, that uh, uh, in, in, in the Bangsamuru region. Uh, so the conclusion, JICA unwavering uh, commitment to our uh, cause, their support in facilitating this educational tool and their uh, broader assistance in our agricultural fisheries sectors have been uh, profoundly uh, instrumental. Our collaboration with uh, JICA is not just techno technological transfer or enhancement, uh, policy enhancement. It is about creating foundation for lasting peace and sustainable development. And let me present my takeaway, personal takeaway. So next, uh, when we made our courtesy to the president, that last day of our uh, educational tour, that I think uh, on uh, September 15, and he told us, uh, what, whatever you see here in uh, Japan, good and bad are based on Japan's history, culture, and experience. It's really enlightened us, and uh, we look forward that uh, the uh, development in the Bangsamuru may be based on the history of Bangsamuru, culture, and experience. Thank you very much for our, your, your uh, giving the attention for my presentation. Thank you so much, Minister Jacob. Now we would like to hear from Director Farah Naparan on the brief background on the Bangsamoro peace process. So um, this presentation will be very brief. I'll make it quick. And I'm thankful because some of the points were already discussed by the prior um, speakers, especially Minister Yako. So for this um, discussion, I'll be focusing more on the implementation of the peace process with the MILF and things that we look forward with the guidance with the president. So going back, we understand that conflict in Mindanao is based on the moral struggle, it is on the context that their historical and distinct um, historical background and heritage have not been properly addressed or recognized. And hence, there were a series of histori historical injustices, um, legitimate grievances, and human rights violations, as well as marginalization through land dispossession that transpired decades before. So in the, not in the nutshell, we can see that, as shown in the screen, these are the context of conflict in Mindanao. So much has been poured in, in terms of funds during the Olot War, displaced persons, and the lowest poverty rate in the country. And as said by our professor, um, the former chair of the government implement uh, of the government negotiating panel, the causes of the more antagonism to the Philippine state can best be traced to the nature of the both the colonial and post-colonial state and its failure to equitably address the economic, social, cultural, and political dimensions of minoritizing manifested in relative deprivation, cumulative loss of control over ancestral domain, human rights violation, resulting from militarization and marginalization in political processes and society in general. So in the series of years, as mentioned also a while ago by Minister Yacob, there have been attempts in the national government to start the peace process. Of course, we had it with the MNLF, the Moro National Liberation Front, and then later on we have the negotiation with the Moro Islamic Liberation Front. Before we came and was able to sign the peace agreement, the CAB, in 2014, we had 17 years of negotiation. And now we had a marching order from the president 
no less than the president himself said during the CAB ANIV last March 2023 that the president and his government shall not waver in seeing through that all of the peace agreement commitment will be implemented. So if we go back to the peace agreement, the CAB is very essential and it's dynamic. Why is it dynamic? It is composed of two tracks. We have the political track, that is the establishment of the Bank Samoro Autonomous Region in Muslim Mindanao, and then we have the normalization track, uh, that's the red part. And if you look at the normalization track, it's very comprehensive. So it's composed of different components, and it is timed. So it is being conducted in various phases. And as shown this, this on the screen, this is the comprehensive infrastructure in the peace process. So currently, some of the mechanisms have already been defunct, some of them have already been um, dismantled, and some are still existing. And most of these mechanisms are composed of both members from the government and the MLF. So what makes this peace process um, unique is that it's not only composed of members from the government and the MLF, we have also a substantive participation from the international community. Um, as mentioned a while ago, we have those from the IMT, we have from the independent decommissioning body, we have the international contact group, and of course, we also have previously the independent commission on policing and the TJRC. And I will not be discussing this um, framework, but this framework actually focuses on the dynamic um, connection of peace in having conflict transformation that has to be connected to the value chain development and comprehensive development so that we are able to establish sustainable development and peace in Bangsamoro. So if we go back to the agreement, this is the second part of the CAB. This is the normalization track, and it refers to the human security in the Bangsamoro. So it's a set of processes. It is composed of different mechanisms. And what makes it very, very different is that it has to be done in partnership with the MILF. So we cannot reach an agreement, and we cannot do or implement things without having a joint agreement with them. So in the Annex of Normalization, the normalization actually refers to um, the process where in the communities, they transform from conflict and they achieve the desired quality of life, which includes pursuit of sustainable livelihood and political participation within a peaceful, deliberative society. So that is kind of mouthful, but later on you'll see how it is done. So this is the whole component of the normalization. It's very comprehensive, it's dynamic, it's composed of security um, component, and then we have socioeconomic programs, we have confidence building measures, and of course, transitional justice and reconciliation. So in a sense, normalization is not just security, but a number of components are under this dimension. So in normalization track, we're just going through it very, very fast. I hope if you have questions later, we can um, discuss some of them. We have the joint peace and security team. So this is a um, team composed of composite members from the government and the MLF. So it's AFP, PNP, and the BEF. And we have around 22 of them officially deployed, but 24 have already been trained. And we also have mechanisms to disband the PAGs. We have the National Task Force on the disbandment of PAGs. And right now we have a program being developed with the UNDP and also support from the Japanese government on ASPAR. This is the SALW program. And on the decommissioning process, so this is the um, summary of where we are right now. From phases one to three, we were able to decommission 26,132 combatants and 4,625 weapons. So it's not the government that decommissions the MILF, it is the independent decommissioning body. And this is composed of different countries. The chair is Turkey with members from Brunei, Norway, um, and of course recently with Japan at the IDBHQ. So you can see that it is phased. We have it in four phases. And hopefully, if the MILF already submits, submits its list, because we have not yet, the IDB has not yet received it, we hope to start the phase for the commissioning as early as December, if it is the best case scenario, or if not, perhaps in 2024. So just a caveat for everyone, we do not use the term surrender. We use the term turn in of weapons and the commissioning of combatants. So that is a product of negotiation. It's an agreed um, terminology. So under normalization, we also have an important component. This is the socioeconomic track. So once the, the MLF have been decommissioned, they have to be transferred to another task force. It's a task force 
on the decommissioned combatants and their community. So what do they receive? So they receive transitional cash assistance, livelihood programs, civil protection um, components, um, educational grants, and they also have community-based infrastructure in their communities. And apart from that, we also have interventions inside the MILF camp. So we only have six MILF camps. The seventh is Camp Darapanan that has been um, recognized by the government. And that's part of the normalization that we have to transform the MLF camps from conflict to peaceful communities. And then, of course, not working. Okay, I know. I, I think this is the old presentation. No, it's all. It's okay. I'll just. Okay, so let's um, continue. So part of the normalization track is the program on amnesty. So actually this is the, it has not been updated. Anyway, we'll just proceed with the presentation. Are you moving it, Jan? Okay, so I'll just give you a very brief background. This is also part of the um, security component. It's been mentioned by Minister Jacob. It's part of the security track of the normalization process. And um, policing the Bank Somoro under this aspect, there have been already 102 MLF and MNLF applicants who took their oath to become part of the PNP. So this is part of the recruitment process based on the, on the Bank Somoro organic law. And the second phase has already started last September 9. So we are expecting that um, we complete the 400 slots, hopefully, and then the succeeding years is still up for discussion at the IGR level. So under the confidence building measure, we also have amnesty. Um, why do we term it as convergence? It's convergence in a sense that this is not only offered to the MLF, this is also offered to the MLF, but, but of course with different sets of proclamations. So the president in 2021 issued a proclamation for MLF and MNLF. Um, and the National Amnesty Commission was organized pursuant to EO 125. And right now, it's a complete team. But however, since the one year application period has already lapsed, last January 2023, we have to expect for a new um, proclamation, an amnesty that has to be approved by the president. So we just go back to, I'll not um, discuss anymore the MNLF peace process. So what makes the normalization track um, special is in a sense that it harnesses the whole of government approach. So under the national government, we have the intergabinet cluster mechanism that was issued through EO um, 79 and later amended into EO 6. So it harnesses and mobilizes all government agencies to work together to advanced normalization. And we hope also that the Bank Samora government does the same so that there can be a collaborative um, partnership within the Bank Samora government and the national government agencies. So to close this discussion, the president during his sauna stated that he intends to issue a proclamation granting amnesty to rebel returnees to complete their reintegration process. So we hope that this year a proclamation would be issued and that through the BARM, the president also said that the nation's prospects for achieving sustainable progress anchored on true and lasting peace in southern Philippines have been strengthened. So with the directive from the president, we hope that we see through the completion of the CAB and of course we cannot do that alone with the government and with the MLF, of course the civil society and of course our development partners. Thank you. Thank you so much, Director Naparan, for very rich information. Now we'd like to call on Dr. Uh, Jennifer Oreta to share her lessons and reflections on the peace building in the Bank Samoro region. All right. 
magandang hapon, good afternoon to everyone. And I guess the folly of being the last speaker is that all of you are rearing either to ask questions or to ask or to go home. No? Um, so I will just be very brief. Can we go to the next slide, please? So I divided my discussion into three, and I think uh, it's really more a reflection of uh, what Professor Shinoda has mentioned, contextualizing it to the Bangsamoro. Uh, but basically, I tried to summarize what I, I have in mind into three. The first one is on the peace process. The second is on reflections. And the third, perhaps, is what are the futures of the peace process. So uh, when we talk about the peace process here, I would like to show that this is still the framework, the peace framework that the government um, has. No? You will see that it's a, it's a comprehensive framework that brings together peace negotiation or peace talks, peace building, and peacekeeping. So the peace talks is what have been discussed by Farah and elaborated further by Minister Yacoub. Uh, uh, so this is the negotiation between the state and the non-state. And then you have the peace building where the, you have the different actors, government, non-government, uh, ensuring that the gains of the peace negotiation also benefits the communities. No? And then you have the peacekeeping, uh, the peacekeeping units. No? These are the security forces uh, stabilizing the security situation so that the peace building and the peace negotiation can actually move forward. In an ideal setup, this is how it works. No? But then in the next slide, no, we... We look at the, and these are the fundamental, just look very quickly, the fundamental goals of the peace process is number one, as I've said earlier, to forge a political settlement with the armed group. And uh, the second one is really more for the communities affected by armed conflict, you know, to convince them that peace actually works, you know, that they can benefit you know, from what we call the peace dividends in the form of delivery of basic services, infrastructure development, livelihood, employment, dispute resolution, security management. No, so these two must actually work hand in hand together in order for uh, for the peace process no, to be successful. Next slide. But then again, you have the context. No? So as I've said, no, you have the peace framework, but you also have the context. No? In the current context in the Bangsamoro, we have the organizations that were already mentioned earlier. You have the MNLF, the MILF, and the ASG. When you get out of this room later on, I'm sure you already have you know, a lot of this um, alphabet soup no, uh, 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 in your head. No? Uh, but the complicating factor here is that while they are separate organizationally. This, the members of these three organizations are connected by family, no? uh, family connections. No? So there's family connections or they are connected because of the clan conflict. No? So while they are separate as an organization, there is a somehow a broken line that uh, brings them together. No? And then another complicating factor would be the breakaway groups. No? So you have the breakaway group of the MNLF, which actually led the Sambuanga siege in 2013. I'm not sure if you have heard about it, but uh, that actually complicated a lot of the negotiation uh, or during the, the negotiation in 2013. No? And then you also have the breakaway group of the MILF, which is the BIFF, no, and this um, and the BIFF and the Abu Sayyaf both, in 2016, uploaded their uh, their uh, their YouTube uh, video declaring that they are affiliating themselves with ISIS, no. So again, the track of the uh, the peace process actually is moving forward, but you have these kinds of what we call horizontal conflicts that's happening. No? So the government and the MILF are actually moving forward with the peace negotiation and the de delivery of services or the delivery of the commitments. But you have the horizontal factors or horizontal conflicts that are actually moving forward. Next. Okay, so in, sorry, back, back. Okay, and here, no, uh, uh, what I wanted to show here, it's not a very complicated um, uh, 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 diagram here, but what I wanted to show here is that the peace process and the military action are actually working simultaneously together. No? So they are both uh, existing in the same operational battle space. No? And the difficulty is that one wrong move, for example, of the military, you know, whether it is uh, the focused military operation or even the, land, the law enforcement operation, can actually have a significant effect no, in the implementation of the peace process. So that's actually the, 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 the 
uh, the issue that needs to be wrestled with, with no, here in, uh, in the Bangsamoro. Next. Now we move now to the, what are the lessons and the reflections? No? The peace process, as I have, uh, I think it was already impressed upon you in the, in the, well, with the uh, several speakers before me, is really a complicated and challenging process. No? So we see a lot of progress. No? We, need to, we need to give credit to that. We need to acknowledge that. No? But there are also a lot of potential landmines. No? The, uh, the first no, uh, is that the political, economic, and security environment especially in geographically isolated and depressed areas are still incubators of radical ideas. No? So these areas, uh, in the language of the government, they call it the GIDA area, geographically isolated and depressed areas. These areas are not, it's hard to reach no, by the services of the government. And if it is hard to reach, it's also easier to radicalize dissent. No? So you still have these kinds of areas, the enclaves. No? The power uh, is still in the hands of the elite and those, and unfortunately, especially in the Bangsamoro, uh, uh, a lot of those who run for power, no? the, the political families or the old oligarchs, no? Uh, once elected, they use their access to power resources and inform information to consolidate their economic and political power. They still have that, no? Uh, even if the peace process is moving forward, you still have these kinds of political families that are really using the state no, for their own benefit. There are also a lot of gray areas no, in these areas. No? And you, what, are, what's, what do we mean by gray area? These are areas where there is ambiguousness on whether or not particular situations are legal or illegal. No? Uh, so uh, uh, illegal uh, or uh, legitimate, uh, it may be a legitimate uh, operation, it, but it also might be illegal or there are questionable legal frameworks. No? And armed groups and militia formation in, uh, in the Philippines, no? as we have witnessed in the Marawi siege in 2017, actually show their fluidity of movement from legal, political, and criminal. No? This creates really a huge gray area that actually creates a problematic situation, especially for the government. Next slide. And then what, is, what can we expect no, as future for the peace process? No? The, the Bangsamoro peace process has greatly stabilized no? the security situation in BARM. And the, and the commitment of uh, both the MNLF and the MILF to hold on to the peace process has been sustained because the government has been also committed no, in the implement implementation of commitments, plus the close partnership of relevant government agencies and NGO and INGO no, have not let up the, pre the process. They have... They continue to hold on. No? They journey with the peace process. And peace partners like JICA has really played a significant role no? from the negotiation phase until the present institution building in the Bangsamoro. JICA has been a very steady partner of the peace process. No? So the various interventions done has really uh, improved the situation. However, uh, uh, the proliferation of armed groups and irregular forces continue in these areas. No? Next slide. And this is my last slide. No? So the armed groups, in, especially in Jajida areas or depressed areas, gain legitimacy in communities because they fill the service gaps of government in the community setting. So the, in order to stabilize the security, in the, uh, particularly in these areas, it's necessary that the components no, of normalization, which means the dismantling of PAGs or private armed groups, no, maintaining the peace and order by going after the criminality or the criminal organization, settlement of redo no, uh, or clan conflict, this must gain traction. So while development partners have not wavered, central still in finding solution to armed groups formation is still to address the fuels of armed conflict. And here, LGU, you know, the role of the LGU cannot be, uh, cannot be underscored. No? So the LGU is really the BIDA. No? They are the focal group, no? the focal, uh, or the they play a central role in the whole of government, no? uh, whole of government discussion. No? So finally, and strategically, the sustainability of the solutions, you know, the peace pro to the peace uh, and peace building, uh, it's, it remains contingent on a political system that is inclusive of the various sectors and groups, you know, consistent in policy.
policy and operation, a strategic mindset in the programming of intervention and partnership with the communities, especially on matters of security management, are necessary conditions to achieve lasting and durable solutions. So with that, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Errata. Um, before we, we invite Professor Shinoda to share his thoughts and lessons from the panelists, let us give all our panelists a round of applause for, the, for sharing all this very rich information and their insights and reflections. Um, we would like to uh, also uh, tell everyone that we will extend for a little, uh, for a few minutes, around 15 minutes, so to make sure that you'll have a time to ask questions to our uh, esteemed panelists and uh, guests. So with, with this, I would like now to invite Professor Shinoda to share his thoughts on the lessons from the panelists that he learned. A very quick feedback. Just briefly, uh, you can tell how important Mansamoro is for Japan. Uh, Japan is committed to many peace building areas, but because of our interest in Asia, close relationship with the Philippines, uh, we all believe that uh, it's so wonderful if we can contribute to the peace in uh, Bansamoro. So uh, that's what I really would like to emphasize, really. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Shinoda. Now, we'd like to open the floor for questions from our participants, both, on, both online and on-site. Um, first, we would like to acknowledge the different universities who are present in this forum. From our students, faculty, and staff from Ateneo de Manila University, Far Eastern University, the University of the Philippines, De La Salle University, Lyceum of the Philippines, Mariano Marcos State University, and the Mindanao Cox Coxai Daigaho. We truly appreciate your effort in joining our lecture. And now I'd like to open the floor for questions from the participants. I know there are many questions. I see slide. So we will open it for, uh, we will get questions around, uh, I, we get two questions uh, for, for the on-site and another two from, from our online. So can you help? Can you just use the light, uh, can you, uh, I mean, uh, Please use the mic. We have two mics on the side. So, um, yeah, for the first one who raises his hand, and please identify yourself so we'd know. Thank you. So, uh, good afternoon. Uh, I'm from, I'm Melchizedek Mendoza from Lyceum of the Philippines University, Manila. So, this question is addressed to the MAFAR Minister, Muhammad Yaqob and to the Director Farah Grace Naparan. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. And mapya malulam, Minister. So given your broad experience on this subject matter, my question will revolve around in the status of the Electoral Code of the Bank Samoro. So what is, now of the st what is now the status of the Electoral Code? And are there any mechanisms in play for the information dissemination and education and campaigns to the respective locals of BARM in relation to the electoral code? And also, are there any provisions in the electoral code wherein the rights of non-Moro IP are addressed in terms of their representation? Uh, well, uh, we are all aware that uh, based on my presentation, among the uh, priority code was uh, enacted by the parliament that the electoral could. But unfortunately, uh, some of uh, the group filed a case to the Supreme Court telling some of the provision, uh, provision were unconstitutional. So we are the, the member of the parliament uh, waiting for what is the progress of that uh, uh, filing the case against that uh, electoral code. So the uh, electoral code really address uh, political track uh, inclusively. In fact, uh, the uh, IP, uh, one of the sector uh, can represent even uh, without go to the uh, uh, election as provisional member of the parliament. So 
that's so far I uh, know about it. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. Now we have an on online question. Uh, yeah. I think one of the questions I would be responded by our colleagues from JICA, where do you envision the partnership between JICA and the Philippines to go within 10 years, especially in this context of the Bangsamoro peace process? Oh. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Um, particularly on the uh, issues of uh, Bansamoro uh, peace process, I think that we are, uh, first of all, we are aiming at the uh, transition to the regular farm in 2025. And toward that milestone, we have been working on the capacity development of the BTA executive branch, as well as trying to deliver uh, better public services as well as better uh, infrastructure development. And I think uh, the, uh, the partnership with the PTA Parliament is an additional endeavor uh, to create a better uh, governance uh, in the reg regular bound. And beyond that milestone is the question we are uh, having and we are discussing, and I think we are learning a lot from uh, dialogue uh, discussion uh, today, but uh, as I mentioned before, the peace, process, peace building is a long-term process. It will not finish with the establishment of the regular bomb. And the next round would be how to maintain the cycle of uh, regular uh, elections and maintaining the um, regular bomb with the uh, uh, bomb uh, parliament. So I think uh, we continue to support the capacity development of the uh, BAM government, as well as the uh, public service delivery and infrastructure development, so that the, uh, the, the, the people in the BAM region will benefit from this peace uh, dividend. So in the beginning, we are delivering a very uh, um, uh, direct uh, livelihood improvement but I think the ambition would be getting higher. So I think we need to keep up with the uh, increased ambition and aspiration of the citizens, uh, particularly from the youth, so that we are hoping that the infrastructure development as well as the human resource development will enhance the, uh, the vibrant economies, uh, job creations, um, and, um, and more importantly, it will be an inclusive uh, development so that uh, we can uh, we can consolidate the peace process in the Mindanao. Thank you so much, Dr. Director Muratan. Now we open the floor again from our on-site participants. Anyone from? The, yes, I think. Thank you. Um, hello, Konnichiwa. Um, I am Naomi, and I would like to ask towards the JICA. Um, so Japan is known for its vast land and agriculture and its culture as well. And you have mentioned that the JICA supports the agriculture and fisheries in B-A-R-M-M, -M rather. So I would like to ask, aside from the support towards agriculture and fisheries in B-A-R-M-M, -M, what else can the JICA offer? to the BARMM, or if possible, to the other regions in the Philippines, aside from the aforementioned sectors. Thank you. So I think uh, I, I, I might be repeating the same, uh, same thing, but I think uh, the, the challenge now we are facing is how we can develop the uh, um, trainings for the farmers in terms of the agricultural development. And through our comprehensive uh, capacity development project to Pansamoro, we are now somewhat um, 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 uh, upgrading our uh, engagement in agriculture, not only providing uh, basic trainings for the farmers, but also uh, encouraging the farmers to think about how they um, how they can sell their products, how they can better access the market without making trouble with the uh, middle person. So what we are in, in, uh, intending to introduce through the SHEP approach 
is something to encourage uh, farmers to think about grow to sell rather than just growing the products and sell. So that's something we wish to uh, continue to support. And that uh, um, uh, program has to be complemented by our efforts of industry promotion as well as the infrastructure development because those uh, farmer to farmer to market roles will be a basic infrastructure that will encourage the farmers to think about the, their or own market. And I am hoping that the industry promotion activities would enhance uh, other potential uh, industries uh, in the BAM region so that hopefully in the future we can uh, we work on uh, other sectors too. Thank you so much for the answer. Now we go to our online question. Uh, this question is actually very related to the earlier question on site, but I think with the, 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 uh, this would be responded by both uh, members from the Philippines and Japan. Do you think Japan and the Philippines will continue to be good agri agricultural partners a century from now? <laughs> so I have emphasized enough the yes. importance of the long-term engagement. Yes. <laughs> I, and I believe it's going to be yes, because the agriculture is uh, very important. Yeah. And the, I will <laughs> ask Yakov san for your uh, century vision. <laughs> yes, um, we are all aware the Bangsam region economic based on agriculture and fisheries. So uh, we uh, ambition to uh, provide food to the citizens and even to the country. So in response to the uh, uh, request of the president, make agriculture, fisheries, uh, significant contribution to our economy nationally and regionally the ministry ambition to sin theory plan to make uh, food sufficient in the region and in the country. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Now we heard the commitment from both parties. Um, we have time for one more from on-site. Please. Uh, okay. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, good afternoon. I am Leon Pasho from Lyceum of the Philippines University, uh, Manila. So this uh, question is, uh, I'm going to ask this uh, directly to, the, to JICA. Uh, since we talked about JICA's partnership with BARMM for peace and stability, what are JICA's other key objectives for peace and stability in other parts of the Philippines, especially on conflict-torn areas? Thank you. I think Ochai san gave me a good advice. So, thank you, thank you very much. But I think uh, the the, the uh, in other uh, uh, in in Philippines, other than uh, BAM, uh, we have other activities uh, investing in infrastructure, uh, social development. So I think all these um, uh, development cooperation would enhance the uh, livelihood of the uh, citizens, and uh, we are hoping that uh, all these uh, JICA's engagement would be uh, support to build uh, resilient uh, societies, a resilient, inclusive, and uh, sustainable societies. So the, we have two missions uh, for JICA uh, globally. One is human security, protecting human uh, pe people's uh, life, livelihood and dignity. And the other mission is the quality growth, uh, which is the growth that is uh, inclusive, resilient, and sustainable. And I think achieving this quality growth in the Philippines would uh, contribute to the uh, betterment of the uh, 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 other uh, uh, areas and would address the challenges for the peaceful society. Thank you very much. Uh, okay, there's one more, I think, so that to have a balance as a requ for the request of Sakamoto's son. One more question, so we will, from this side. 
uh, on that because we want, I think, from the yes, please. Yes, please. Yes, yes, you on the black. Um, hello, good afternoon to our speakers. I'm Irian from the Far Eastern University International Studies. My question is, in relation to the involvement of JICA to the Bar and Peace Talks, what role did the international mediation and support play in facilitating the Bank Samara peace negotiations? And what were the outcomes of these efforts towards a more sustainable peace talks? Thank you, very much. Thank you very much for your question. Um, as, I, as, I talk, as I represent, well, as I talk about uh, the three dimensions of our approach, is one of uh, pe for peacemaking. Uh, for peacemaking, there is uh, international contact group, group, which was which is composed of the UK, Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, Turkey, and, and Japan. Uh, through the actually through the uh, Jap Japanese embassy in Manila. Uh, uh, atten were attending every time to for the peace negotiation between the MLF and and uh, uh, Philippine government uh, through 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 the ICG activities. Japanese government gave uh, uh, fruitful and valuable uh, suggestion or support to directly to the peace negotiation between the Philippine government. As for the JICA, as a uh, organization of uh, providing official development assistance of Japanese government, we made uh, we uh, 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 implemented implementing of uh, so-called uh, consolidation of peace in Mindanao, which is shortly name of COP. Uh, we invite uh, as uh, 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 because JICA is not it not. That, uh, uh, actually, JICA is a part of the Japanese government, but uh, our role is is not is is different from Japanese government or Jap uh, Japanese embassy. Uh, we provided the area or, or, or a platform not only to to uh, the member of MLF or the member of the peace uh, Philippine government, but also all the every stakeholders like uh, LGU, acad academics, and NGO and uh, even uh, uh, traditional uh, leaders in, in the area to get together to discuss about peace. This is so-called two uh, track two mechanisms. So what, what JICA is contributing is to provide the area or arena for everybody to discuss about peace for in Mindana. Thank you. Thank you so much. Mr. Ochi, I, uh, I'd like to call on either Dr. Areta or uh, Director Napaaran to, to also share their thoughts on the question. So one last feedback on, on the question that was raised about international relations. International, the role of international bodies yes. or international. The, 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 the development partners, the international development partners have been a consistent partner of the peace talks. No? And I think a major contribution that they have provided is really not letting, not to let go of the, 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 their support to the peace negotiation. So in particular with the MILF, as mentioned by Ochai San, uh, the international contact group no, was always present. And then there's another, uh, the NGO component. The ICG component is the government component, and then there is an NGO compon component composed of INGO no, that is also uh, monitoring the, implement the negotiation. So in other words, they are critical in, pro uh, in, in supporting, but they are also critical in putting pressure, international pressure, so that the two parties will remain in the negotiating table. Just to, to add on the context and the role of the international um, donors and, of course, the partners in the peace process, I think uh, what makes the peace process in the Bank tomorrow, I, I'll be focusing on the GPH MLF peace process, is that it is not inclusive only to the government and the MLF. Um, when it started, as mentioned by uh, Mr. Urchiai, 
it started with the effort for the Japanese government to have an informal meeting between um, then President Aquino and of course um, Chair Murad in Tokyo in 2011. And since then, when the peace talks started, of course the Japanese government is part of the international contact group. And as mentioned by um, Professor um, Oreta, who's also a member of the government technical working group on normalization during the ne negotiations, they sat there at the table to ensure that there's a level of trust and confidence between the parties. And that is the formal one, as mentioned by Mr. Chia. It's more of the formal domain. But at the backdrop, we have those in the communities, those at the ground, that is supported by the international community also, who try to, yes ma'am, the local monitoring team, we all the, the try to mirror, to augment, or to have parallel efforts so that there is both from the top and the bottom approach and how to sustain the, the peace talks at that time. Um, the JICA entered into the picture, I think, even before there is the CAB, it has already been providing assistance. So I, I think that the mantra of JICA at that time is to engage and provide support to the Bank Samoro even without yet the signing of the agreement. So that's part and parcel of ensuring confidence building in the grounds. So when the CAB was signed in 2014, of course, even before that, we have the Japanese in the international monitoring team. It was observing the implementation of the ceasefire agreement and the role of the Japanese government then is on the socioeconomic assistance component. But they ended it in 2019 because they moved to the independent decommissioning body. So they're assisting us in the decommissioning part. So we can see here the movement of their interest on how they can assist the Bank Samoro government. And of course, the peace process with the, between the government and the MLF. I think with international body, I think it would be nice to highlight also how they try to augment, to have parallel effort, but of course, it should be in line with the aspirations of the parties. I think that is what is essential. Um, what they define should be, uh, should be based on what the parties have agreed and what is being expounded or conveyed in the ground. Because in the Philippines, the peace process is indigenous. So that's the, the I think that's the, the nature of the peace process in the Bank Samoro. Even when the peace talks started, it, it did not in, uh, start as at the international stage. It started at the domestic stage. But for it to be successful, we understand that we need the international partners because they put a level of pressure and a third party lens. Thank you so much, Director Naparan and Dr. Oreta. I think it, on that last note, we would like to thank our speakers, panelists, and participants for an engaging discussion this afternoon. Uh, my role as a moderator is quite tight because I, we have limited time and we know that you have many questions. And with, on that regard, we would like to, to, to tell you that you can still uh, message us for your, com for your questions or feedback and we will make sure that your question will reach the right person on this panel. So we apologize that we don't have enough time, otherwise I think they will ha we have to leave the the, the venue. Um, and now, we would like to call the Chief Representative of JICA, Mr. Takema Sakamoto, for the closing remarks. Thank you. Honorable Minister of Agriculture, Fisheries, and Agrarian Reform, Ban Samoro Transition Authority, Mohammed Yaakob, my friend. And uh, uh, from the Ateneo de Manila University, uh, Dr. Oreta, uh, Dr. Giren, and Dr. Uh, Santos. And the uh, director uh, from OPAPO, uh, Farah Napar Naparan. Uh, professor Professor of the Tokyo University of Foreign Studies, Dr. Shinoda Hideaki, of course. And from JICA, uh, my colleagues, uh, Murotani Ryutaro and Ochiai Naoyuki. Uh, colleagues from Ateneo, Embassy of Japan and JICA, participants from various governmental agencies and universities, maybe still MKD is online, right? Okay, uh, we're here. <laughs> yes, here, okay. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Ines Yamanouchi Mariari, university, uh, university president of MKD. And uh, so, uh, uh, magandang hapon po sa inyo lahat. 
good afternoon to all of you and assalamu alaikum. It's my great pleasure to join you all here. Uh, today is a truly important opportunity for us to reflect and learn from each other's experiences uh, for the peace building process and uh, very insightful thought. Yes. As uh, shared by our pat uh, panelists, JIG has been supporting the Bansamro peace process more than three decades. We can proudly claim that we were among the first international part uh, partners of the Philippines to launch a comprehensive development assistance package uh, for Bansamro peace process, which is called Jade Bird. It has been a quite a fulfilling journey towards inclusive and sustainable development with peaceful society. The Bansamoro organic law indeed has paved the way for the Bansamoro people to determine their own priorities. JICA has been, of course, supporting this unwaveringly. As a testament of our long-standing partnership with Bansamoro, the Bansamoro Transition Authority Parliament has, in fact, given the honor uh, for JICA President Tanaka to speak at their uh, parliament as the first, fo uh, first, foreign nation, first foreign national in January 2023 this year. JICA was also granted a resolution to appreciate and commend JICA's cooperation in the Bansamoro peace process. This is also an exceptional privilege and honor for us. During this occasion, JICA stressed that we will continue to support Bansamoro's transition to a real, autonomous, and functional government so that people in the region can undoubtedly feel the dividend of peace through the uh, best efforts in securing socioeconomic stability and prosperity. We continue to honor those commitments, Kasama no Kami. As a long standing and close friend of the Bansamoro people, JICA is working with you. This is because JICA believes that the sustainable stability and prosperity of the Bansamoro is not only crucial to this limited region but also to the entire Philippines, the entire Asia, and the world. At this point, let, uh, let's look at our common experiences, learn from each other, and solve challenges together. Personally, today I have learned several important secrets of our successful path, I believe. To name a few, there are three. One, seeking solutions through cooperation and collaboration, not through force and threat. This is one. Second, building and strengthening mutual trust through close and frequent interactions, of course, including the unknown formal interaction as well, maybe. And three, illustrating one clear vision for the brighter future and actual feeling with low-hanging fruits or peace dividends. Peace dividends, yes. Like this, my personal learning case, I wish that all of you enjoyed a productive exchange of ideas and shared values or value of peace from today's seminar. This has been a, a momentous event, I believe, especially since we are celebrating the National Peace Consciousness, Consciousness Month in the Philippines this month, uh, which aims to make everyone an active peacemaker. I believe you all know our joint efforts and dedication to the stable and the prosperous Bansamoro deserve the Nobel Peace Prize, I believe. Let's keep it up. We can do it. Nothing is impossible. We can turn the world impossible into I am possible. At my closing, 
I sincerely hope that today's JICA chair special session contributes to the stability and prosperity to the Bansamoro and the entire Philippines, and also presents an exemplary future to the whole world. Shukran Jaziran. Marami marami salamapo, mabuhay. Good afternoon to all of you. Thank you very much. Once again, we would like to thank everyone for the afternoon. Um, for the on-site attendees, please don't forget to complete your attendance sheet. And again, maraming maraming salamat po.